Hey everyone, welcome back to the 2% Better Health Podcast. I am your host, Carrie Bennett, and today is a solo episode. I wanted to spend probably not a crazy long amount of time talking about mitochondria. Uh, it's a buzzword, right? Where a lot of people these days from biohackers to traditional medical practitioners are understanding the importance of mitochondrial health. And I kind of want to put my quantum biology spin on it and how I think mitochondrial health is key, things we can do to support mitochondrial health. And really let's maybe talk about the real role that the mitochondria play inside of our bodies, or maybe a, one that's just been ignored. Um, and so I'd like just to go through all of these things today, maybe about 30 minutes, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so first and foremost, I think it's important to understand where we've come in terms of mitochondria. And I wanna give you mitochondrial evolution or, or the origin of mitochondria, <laughs> Uh, which is called something called the endosymbiont theory uh, in about three minutes, right? I'm going to try to shorten this up, but I think we first have to recognize that mitochondria used to be their own separate bacterium, right? So in ancient world, however long ago you want to consider that in ancient world, before there was multicellular organisms, there was a bunch of just bacteria, archaea, you know, just single celled organisms roaming the planet in, in an aqueous solution in, in, in the uh, area that we call the ocean, right? So just basically a sea of all of these single celled organisms. Uh, and the earth was different, right? It was not, we didn't have the same amount of oxygen. There was, there was no plant life. And so the oxygen levels were scarce. A certain type of bacterium figured out how to really efficiently utilize the scarce oxygen levels to make important things to thrive, right? And so this was the ancient ancestor of the mitochondria. It was this little bacterium who said, wow, these are some harsh conditions. Um, it, but I figured out how to extract just enough oxygen from my environment to be able to make ATP infrared and water, which are really, really key, key things to think about, right? Really key things that I'm going to go into why that's important. So fast forward a little while, right? And uh, the, the story, the endosymbiont theory goes, uh, and if you, you have to look into Lynn Margulis's research, if you really want to dive into this. Um, so you have to give, give her some major credit for the endosymbiont theory of, of the origin of how mitochondria became part of our cells. Okay, so the story goes, you have this little mitochondrion who's really good at extracting the, my, the smaller amounts of oxygen and making ATP water and infrared and thriving, right? It's a thriving little organism. And it comes across another single-celled organism that says, hey, how's it going? This, this little mitochondrion says, well, you know, the conditions are pretty harsh, but I've really figured out how to extract oxygen and, and, and use it into, and turn it into usable stuff for me. So I'm doing okay. My only issue is that these conditions are harsh, right? You know, there's uh, lots of toxic fumes in the air and there's these uh, heat vents, right? It's a, it's a really harsh environment that I'm living in right now. Well, so this bacterium says, well, guess what? You know, I actually have a really strong protective outer shell, right? Not really a shell, right? But membrane, I've got this really protective membrane. So the, the elements don't bother me at all. I'm totally okay if there's toxic fumes. I'm totally fine if there's, um, if there's excessive heat, excessive cold. I'm really, really good at withstanding that. But I'm really, really impressed that you've been able to get that oxygen. It's hard for me to turn that oxygen into something that's useful for me to thrive. And so the story goes that this bacterium and this bacterium made a deal. This one said, you know what, how about I protect you? And you then don't have to worry about protecting yourself against the harsh conditions, but you can then make use the oxygen in the atmosphere and you can go ahead and make energy and water and infrared and all the things that we need in order to thrive together. And so the, the, the story goes, this one that had a stronger membrane engulfed this one that was that was able to utilize the oxygen better and that's how they started to to thrive it's why this one still retains our mitochondria these days still retain their own dna nowhere near the amount that's suspected that they had originally but they still retain their own dna and so then these cells started to divide and become more complex or uh, cells and cellular organisms. And now these days we have mitochondria inside of us because of that very reason. So that means that those mitochondria are really, really adept at 
not only consuming oxygen for us, right? Transforming that oxygen uh, in our bodies, but also they're very good at sensing the environment because they once were their own species. And I think we have to recognize that we don't consider them sensors for us. We basically say, oh, we've got our five senses to tell us everything we need to know. And that's not true at all. Our mitochondria are super keen sensors of what's happening intracellularly, what's happening all throughout my body and also what's happening in my environment around me because they had to sense it when they were their own individual organisms. And so nowadays those mitochondria, I think through the biology textbooks, we've reduced them to only making ATP, right? At any time I teach a class, right? I teach, I teach courses in various different ways, right? Um, a, a couple of college courses, I teach various webinars, I teach various certifications and nine times out of 10, probably more like 99 times out of 100. When I ask people about a mitochondrion, I say, what is this mitochondrion? And they will say, it's the powerhouse of the cell, right? Because that's like this tagline that's been associated with them because they make ATP. ATP is a completely side note that I'm going to dive into. I don't think we really truly understand that ATP is not the, the, the main ener energy currency of the body. Um, and so I can go into that if we have time today. But with these mitochondria, I want us to recognize, yes, they do make ATP, but we have to understand that they also make other things that are very, very important for us. They make uh, at step five in that ATPase of the electron transport chain, they make infrared. So as that turbine spins and pushes protons through it, that spinning, that rotary motor, that motion makes infrared. So mitochondria actually operate at 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the rest of the cell. They're like these little own furnaces, right? They make heat for us. At step four of the electron transport chain, they make water. Step four is where we actually take the oxygen from the air that we breathe and we combine it with uh, from the electron flow with protons to make H2O. So we make water at step four of the electron transport chain. Uh, that's very, very important because for any of you who have followed me for a little while here, you, you know that I love water, right? But when water meets a biological surface, it creates something called exclusion zone water. And if you want to learn more about this, go way back to my episode with Dr. Gerald Pollack, where we talked about this probably about one year ago. Um, he is really the one who made this exclusion zone water prominent, right? In the biological sciences, in chemistry and physics, cross-disciplinary. But what this exclusion zone water is, it's, it's structured water and it's water that separates itself into a positive or into a negative charge and a positive charge. So all throughout our body, wherever we have water, it structures itself into this exclusion zone water, negative zone, positive zone, and it actually has been shown to be a source of potential energy, a massive source of potential energy for the body, just like a battery. It's why a battery has a negative end and a positive end, because that's a, because energy will flow when you have charge separation. Um, and so, so it's very, very interesting to me that the mitochondria make water and they make the infrared, which is the uh, wavelength of light slash heat. They're synonymous, right? The wavelength of light that Dr. Pollock's lab has shown um, to actually expand the exclusion zone, essentially make a bigger battery, make a bigger zone of positive or of negative charge uh, than a bigger zone of positive charge, or maybe a more concentrated zone of positive charge. And therefore you have a bigger battery. So mitochondria are essentially giving us potential energy because they make water and because they make infrared. And I want to say that that uh, battery that's all throughout our bodies is the main, our, one of our main sources of energy. It's that charge separation uh, that really allows us to have this, this energy, potential energy and energy flow. What else do mitochondria do? They make biophotons. We call them a lot of different things, right? But we're called, they're called reactive oxygen species. They're called reactive nitrogen species. Originally, we thought that these were bad, that these, because these were, this was oxidative stress. And yes, there is a point where the mitochondria are making excessive reactive oxygen species. And excessive reactive oxygen species, that can be a challenge, right? That can create damage, it can create inflammation. But in general, reactive oxygen species are actually called, also known as biophotons. They're particles of light. And these particles of light get released, you know, in, uh, at cytochrome one, at cytochrome two, all these other steps of the electron transport chain. And we actually know that they signal things to the rest of the cell and they signal, it's signaling information to the DNA. 
So the mitochondria have a major influence on gene expression because of how they can signal through biophotons. They can also signal um, based on metabolites. So what metabolites are backing up or what metabolites are being used uh, used a lot. That can also signal to the DNA to make uh, to to express certain genes or to turn off certain genes. So we really thought of the the hub of the cell, right? The control of the cell as being in the nucleus with the DNA. The DNA is simply like a blueprint, maybe not even a blueprint. It's just a catalog of proteins, and it's the mitochondria that get to use biophoton signaling to help control which proteins this particular cell needs to make. And then because it's a sensor of its environmental information, it can sense if the cell is under stress. If the cell is under stress, oftentimes that results in lots of biophoton signaling. Um, the, it, it, if it's under stress, the cell will oftentimes have excessive amounts of calcium in it, right? And so one of the things that we know stresses the cell out, and this is Martin, Dr. Martin Paul's work, I think he's at Washington State University, don't hold me to that, but Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, has shown that in, ex in response to non-native electromagnetic fields, the voltage-gated calcium channels, these little pores, essentially, or channels that are on the surface of the cell, they allow excessive amounts of calcium into the cell. Calcium in the cell is something called a second messenger. So the cell tightly regulates its calcium influx because when it gets into the cell, it triggers cascades, it triggers pathways, right? Biochemical pathways. One of the things that happens when we're exposed to non-native electromagnetic fields is you get a, a huge influx of calcium into the cell. And the mitochondria, one of the roles that they that we now know that they do is they try to sequester this excessive calcium for us because excessive calcium, like I said, it, it, it's damaging. It's a signal of stress to the cell. And so the mitochondria then say, oh, well, we're going to actually upregulate and pull that calcium and try to sequester it. This in turn causes excessive biophoton release. So the a release of excessive reactive oxygen species, such as um, hydrogen, like hydrogen peroxide, superoxide. And then ultimately what can happen is you can get the production of something called peroxynitrate and the hydroxyl radical, which are really damaging reactive oxygen species. This is the point where these are not biophotons. This is just oxidative damage that can, that can go unchecked. And so the mitochondria that the mitochondria then has the opportunity to, if it's function, if it's functional, it can then signal that it needs the cell needs to be destroyed. If it senses excessive amounts of damage, it will signal either repair or destruction. So this is another role of the mitochondria that I think we need to pay attention to beyond just producing ATP. It is the mitochondria that decide if the cell is dysfunctional, or if there's certain parts of the cell, certain proteins that are dysfunctional, if it senses dysfunctional cells, it signals a process called autophagy. Autophagy is the body's recycling and repair in uh, process of the cells. So the mitochondria in conjunction with enough melatonin. So this is where we could actually artificial light at night and lack of morning sunlight can become be a detriment to this process because we don't get appropriate melatonin production. But when the mitochondria sense the damage and when they can use the melatonin as a repair hormone, it signals the process of autophagy. Autophagy then is like the cell waving a little flag saying, ooh, this protein is broken, this protein is broken, and then various proteins and things can fuse together, um, organelles can fuse together, and they can kind of share their functional parts. They can get rid of their dysfunctional parts. They get sent to something called the lysosome that kind of is like the digestion, the digestive tract of the cell, not even the tract, but like the stomach of the cell, if you will, that is a bunch of acid that breaks things down. And so all of a sudden, after the autophagy process, the cell is as good as new. Um, the cell is able to say, okay, we need to repair this, this, and this. The mitochondria send that signal. The cell goes into the autophagy mode. And uh, the end result is a cell that's as good as new because of recycling, right? And repair.
the alternative to that is a very energetically expensive thing, which is called ubiquination, which basically is, uh, you know, a complete, you need to completely rebuild a new cell, right? And so the cell is always trying to repair, always trying to recycle, if at all possible, because it's very energetically taxing to the cell to always have to build new, a new cell with all of its new parts. I liken it to this idea of if we have a, uh, a car, right? We're driving a car and the car has a chip in the windshield. Like you're driving down the highway, you know, and a pebble hits the windshield and all of a sudden it gets one of those little cracks, right? Those little holes. Do we get an entirely new car because of that? Or instead, do we call the repair process, right? Do we call, do we call the windshield repair company, have them come and literally just patch up that tiny little chip in the windshield? That would be less money and a heck of a lot easier than building an entirely new car because of a chip in the windshield. And so that's what the mitochondria should be signaling. They should be able to sense when we've got little chips and dents and things in our cellular parts, and they should be able to signal autophagy for us to be able to repair that. But again, this process is going awry. Why, why, why is, does it become dysfunctional? Well, I mean, I do think overconsumption of food is an issue, but I also think a huge issue is inappropriate circadian timing. When we don't have an intact circadian mechanism and we don't have appropriately timed melatonin release, all of these processes get un desynced, unsynced, not synced appropriately. And so we lack the ability to effectively repair and recycle the broken parts in ourselves. Um, we, uh, we are ineffective at autophagy because of the fact that we have poor circadian rhythms and poor circadian mechanisms. So one of the things, that's why one of the main recommendations I give my clients is see as much morning sunlight as you can into naked eyes. It is, it sets a circadian rhythm. That is actually where we start to initiate melatonin production because we turn tryptophan into serotonin in the brain. And then in darkness is when that serotonin can turn into melatonin and be released by my pineal gland. And, uh, and go into, uh, help me do all that autophagic repair when I'm asleep. Uh, and so then the other end of the spectrum is blocking the artificial light at night. Uh, there is a ton of evidence that artificial light at night is damaging, but one of the things that we know it does for sure is it suppresses melatonin production, which makes sense because artificial light, if we're watching a TV, a tablet, a phone, it's a bright shock of light into the eyes. The only time we would have a shock of light that bright would be during the day, right? In the middle of the afternoon, definitely not after sunset. And so all of a sudden it's a confusing signal to the brain. The brain says, oh, well, the day feels like it was getting long enough. Carrie is building up this chemical in her brain called adenosine, which as it builds up really starts to bring up about a little bit of fatigue and getting ready for sleep. But all of a sudden it's really bright. My environment's really bright. And so instead of allowing adenosine to rise and then melatonin to rise, and when they cross, the body goes to sleep and goes into repair mode, we get this adenosine rise, but melatonin gets suppressed. And so that melatonin then is unable, uh, doesn't elevate to the extent we eventually fall asleep, right? But we're not necessarily timing things appropriately. So then the body doesn't get the appropriate repair at night when it needs it. All of this is beautifully timed with the release of something called human growth hormone, which is another, which, you know, starts to get released probably around 10 PM in a circadian fashion, 10 PM till 1 AM in, in that window right there. And uh, it's because the first half of sleep is tied to physical repair of the body, physical repair of the cells, broken proteins, broken parts. And then the second half of sleep is generally tied to um, encoding memories, right? Like doing some memory, uh, short -term, stay, taking stuff from short-term memory to long-term storage. So if we're kind of missing that first half of that the night and we're not syncing things appropriately and we don't have appropriate circadian signaling and melatonin release isn't timed right, and our bedtime is delayed because we've shifted our, uh, we've suppressed our melatonin so that we're not in sync with the human growth hormone release. It just kind of messes that whole process up. So, uh, so we could actually wake up with fresh parts <laughs> every morning if we allow the mitochondria to signal it. We have enough melatonin to help with that repair. We're releasing human growth hormone and we're allowing that process to be a beautiful circuit that takes place every, every 24 hours. The other thing that the mitochondria do for us is they signal apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis is cell death, program cell death, if you will. Mitochondria ultimately say, yeah, we're beyond repair. Like we can't even do autophagy. We're way beyond repair. So it signals this process called apoptosis where the cell basically dies, right? Kills itself uh, for the good of the whole. Uh, 
Uh, and so that's a good thing, right? Because a cell that just kind of continues indefinitely in a dysfunctional mode releases inflammatory signaling into the tissues around it that eventually disrupts the tissues as well. And these are called senescent cells oftentimes. And these senescent cells uh, just release inflammatory cytokines. And so they generate inflammation in the tissue and then that can become dysfunctional to the tissue. And so mitochondria also use apoptosis uh, melatonin and sleep. That's all timed together for that process as well. I think it's why there is a big connection now between artificial light at night and cancer development. We see huge connections between artificial light at night and breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. A lot of these are horm the hor some of the hormonally driven cancers because I think the light plays a huge role in hormone signaling in the body as well. And so if we're at, if it's nighttime and we're sick, we're not able to make melatonin and we're not able to go through apoptosis for these dysfunctional cells, a, one of the, a, one form of a dysfunctional cell is a cell that just wants to, you know, a cell or a group of cells that just wants to divide and divide and divide. That's cancer, right? And the body has a built-in mechanism to get rid of cancerous cells through apoptosis. Uh, and so we need to be able to actually do that process in order to clear, clear out the cells that are potentially um, dividing in this aberrant way. Okay. So, right, you know, yes, they make ATP, mitochondria. Yes, now we know that they make water and they make infrared. So they make this energy battery all throughout our bodies. They, they really are the true source of intracellular hydration. Their ability to make water for us is very, very key. Um, we, then we just talked about how they release biophotons. And this is also why antioxidants, consuming tons of supplemental antioxidants, like, a, you know, greens, powders all the time and crazy amounts of vitamin C and stuff that's actually been shown to potentially be detrimental. One really interesting, because, because we need bio photon signaling to be tied with our, the state of our body. Um, basically meaning if my body went through a little bit of damage for some reason, I'm going to release more bio photons. And that's going to change gene expression. It's going to change cellular function to help then re-optimize the cell in response to that bit of damage. And so a very, very interesting um, study was actually looked at people who were training, uh, doing exercise, right? And so they did exercise and exercise is like, it, it's hormetic, right? It's actually a stressor to the body, but ultimately it's a stressor that the body recognizes as, oh man, that was hard. I don't want Carrie to have to go through that same thing again. She created this damage. So what the, what the body then does is the body adapts to that stressor. It makes me that much stronger, fitter. I can, you know, pump, pump, uh, pump blood more efficiently. I can uptake oxygen better. I actually sometimes make more mitochondria, right? Um, I make stronger muscles in response to this. And so that actually relies a lot on the bio photon signaling that's happened in the, happening to the mitochondria. So what some research has shown is that people who do this exercise that should have a, 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 an effect of, of being advantageous, ultimately, that the body adapts to, to become stronger, fitter, faster, you name it. Uh, when you give these people exogenous antioxidants, meaning they just did their workout and then you give them a whole bunch of greens, juices and, and antioxidant powders and things like that it actually, they actually do not derive the benefit as the, of the same as the group who didn't receive the antioxidants. Um, and so you have to recognize like th th this, these, these oxidants, these reactive oxygen species serve a purpose. They serve a role and no, we don't want them to go unchecked, but also we don't want to suppress them excessively because they serve a role. They actually help the body adapt to stressors. So again, we do, we know that um, the cells, more stress cells emit more light, more bio photon signaling. It's a, it's a way potentially to attract the rest of the body or at least the neighboring cells to say, hey, help me out a little bit. Something's going on, I'm stressed. Mitochondria do the same thing essentially with their bio photon signaling. They release a little bit more light as a means of saying, hey, we're stressed. We gotta kind of buckle down. We gotta hunker down and do some adaptation and repair. Um, we gotta signal a little bit of different gene expression so that we can come back stronger than ever and better than before. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very fine line, right? We, you don't necessarily want to eat garbage, right? There's not, it's not necessarily about eating garbage because junk garbagey foods and things like that are, uh, are an inflammatory stressor to the body. Um, but we also don't need to excessively consume powders 
and 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 juices and things like that um, be, because we think we need tons and tons of antioxidants uh, and all that. The body actually has its own antioxidant system that it recycles, right? From glutathione to vitamin E, vitamin C, that sort of that sort of pathway. So we don't need to excessively um, consume exogenous forms of those things. So the mitochondria help us adapt that way as well. Uh, something else that we have to recognize with the mitochondria is they, they actually have been shown to share the, part of their genome, their circular genome with um, the, our, our nuclear DNA, right? And so we actually now know that there's, there, there's ways for them to take a chunk of their circular DNA and embed it into our nuclear DNA. And we're thinking that that's as a, a means of uh, helping a cell or a body adapt to some sort of uh, environmental stressor, environmental exposure. This happens with like bacteria and viruses a lot, right? That they, the, that the viral uh, RNA we know can get incorporated, right? It's, it's one of the reasons what, that we see, I think what people call a lot of junk DNA uh, in, in the human genome. And it's not really junk. It's just basically us acquiring DNA from other sources that allows us to adapt. Um, and it allows us to be able to uh, understand what's happening in our environment. It's, a, it's an environmental signal, and then we can change gene expression accordingly. So, you know, I mean, I think it's important to recognize that mitochondria um, are way more than just the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, I wish that uh, I wish that I was taught more about this um, in my all of my biology classes, my biochemistry classes that I took, you know, through undergrad, high school, undergrad, grad school, that sort of things. But I think right now it's really cool to start recognizing mitochondria as like a sensor, right? They're a cellular sensor. They're directing traffic. They're releasing signals. They're making heat and light and water and all these really important things that uh, allow the body to function at its best. And so, uh, tending to our mitochondria, I think is a really, really key strategy. So I'm going to end with a couple of things that I think are really awesome for mitochondrial health. Um, the first one is building exclusion zone water and getting the right type of light into the body. Uh, red light therapy devices are, are popular these days, right? They contain red and infrared wavelengths of light. They contain, those devices generally contain four wavelengths, two of red light, two of infrared. The sun actually contains a huge spectrum of red and infrared frequencies. But I think that that red and that infrared, because it can penetrate so deeply into the body, it's actually very supportive of mitochondrial function. The red light specifically helps to support cytochrome four, step four of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. It allows, uh, if we have excessive nitrogen, I'm sorry, excessive nitric oxide bound up in, in that complex spore, that we, we don't allow electrons to flow through and we don't allow ultimately the production of water to be made. So that kind of jams up the process. But we know that red light frequencies displace that nitric oxide, um, excessive nitric oxide, and allows that it restores electron flow. And so we definitely want a restored electron flow because that keeps the, uh, the hydrogen uh, buildup or the proton buildup in the inner membrane space nice and strong so that we're spinning a ton of uh, of protons through the step five ATPase and generating tons, generating tons of ATP and generating tons of infrared. Uh, and so we want that process to be optimized. So light is key, red light and infrared light. So exposing our body, our naked skin to the sunlight is very, very important. And infrared's available from, and red light is available pretty, pretty much from sunrise until sunset. So anytime we can expose our body to that, that's great. The other thing that I like uh, people to focus on is uh, if, if you, if, if you are not inflamed and you're not leptin resistant, I like intermittent fasting. I think everyone at least can consume all of their calories and nutrients within about an eight hour window earlier is better in the day. Um, that allows for at least 16 hours where the body's not digesting food and can, can, and can potentially upregulate autophagy and repair. And then lastly, I love cold plunges, cold plunging or cold exposure actually helps to create efficiency of electron flow through the mitochondria. Uh, it forces the mitochondria to make more heat. Heat makes more of that exclusion zone water and that exclusion zone water actually helps hold the electron transport chain proteins in the exact right spacing to flow electrons. So it's a really, really important thing. The shape of the mitochondria, the spacing of the mitochondrial electron transport chain uh, complexes matters. And so cold plunging can help with that. Cold plunging also increases a substance on the inner, inner mitochondrial membrane called cardiolipin. 
Cardiolipin also helps to keep that inner mitochondrial membrane and the spacing of the electron transport chain proteins uh, regulated tightly. And so cold plunging can be another really, really good way to go about um, improving, improving mitochondrial function. The other thing you want to pay attention to is avoiding things that trigger mitochondrial inflammation. So there are toxins in the environment, but one of the main ones that I'm seeing these days is exposure to non-native electromagnetic fields. Um, so I, I, I use everything wired, right? I wire everything in my, in my, um, work area, but all these days, if I go into a typical office space, uh, I will see wireless monitor, wireless headphones, or, you know, AirPods. I will see a wireless mouse. I'll see wireless keyboard. I will see a Wi-Fi router right next to the desk. I will see someone's cell phone right next to that. Um, and that, uh, from Martin Paul's work, we know will cause that excessive influx of calcium into the cell, major, major stressor signal to the mitochondria. That mitochondria goes into cell danger mode and it really, really creates dysfunctional cells and uh, dysfunctional signaling in the mitochondria themselves. So being aware of our non-native electromagnetic field environment can make a huge difference in terms of not uh, forcing those mitochondria to always think they're in a super stressed out state, which, uh, which changes their dynamics. It changes their energy flow, uh, changes their signaling. So yeah, well, yeah, that was about what, 30 minutes or so. Anyways, that's uh, a little bit about mitochondria. If you want to learn more about mitochondria, I'm going to link below. I did a webinar on it. Uh, that's really, really uh, extensive on this. So if you want to uh, take a look and, uh, and purchase that webinar, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you want to learn more about light, I also am going to link a course that I've done called connect to the light. It's a step one course in terms of what I consider three really important things that we need to address, um, and light being one of them. And so it goes through 10 mod modules of how to optimize light, whether it's minimizing artificial light, whether it's changing our office space around what, when to get sunlight at different times, what it does for the body. And so I'll link that below as well. Um, again, I think that's a really, really important fundamental thing that we can all do to support our overall health, but especially if we're looking to tend to our mitochondria. So I hope you learned something and hopefully uh, I will see you next time.